Do you know what it feels like to be an outsider? To feel like the other, no matter what situation you're in? Even more, are you aware of when you might be othering someone else? In this episode of Moments of Truth, I talk with Riaz Patel. He's a two-time Emmy-nominated TV producer. He's a Muslim Pakistani immigrant who knows all too well the experience of being othered. He also happens to be one of my favorite human beings who has dedicated his life to building bridges between groups of people who find themselves on polarized ends of an issue. His story is poignant and deeply inspiring. Take a listen. We asked Patel what another thrill it is to be in your presence. I am always just so full of joy whenever I get to be with you. It's mutual, it's mutual. Uh, nobody I know has studied the intersections of human differences more than you. <laughs> um, and what I most love about the way you've done it is that you're, you're like a human Switzerland. Right? You do this without, without judgment, without, with compassion, without, with tremendous patience. Um, and I also know from your own story, that's come at a cost. So I want people to hear the story behind the story, because mm -hmm. I know you have been othered. You know, mm -hmm. In one of my interviews with you, um, I feel like I've made a career out of interviewing you. You said to me, um, uh, I, I've only known being a minority no matter where I go. You know, I've never had a group to belong in. Um, you talked about the ground, when you know you're other, you feel the ground shifting away from you. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so tell, tell us your story. Tell us about what that means for you. And the, the, the tremendous compassion you have has had come at a cost, but it has an origin. I think it's important to hear that. I, I, it's funny, I, I do, someone referred to it recently as my origin story. And I was like, oh, I never really thought of it that way. Um, just by, by, the, by the situation of my life, you know, we moved here to America from Pakistan very young. And so, and in, into a rural area, because at the time America was quite, um, had another wave of anti-immigrants. Um, and so it was very hard for my father, who was a British trained surgeon, to get employment here without being forced to repeat his residency, even though he had Western education. And so we found that the places that were open to him were very, very rural communities, very poor, very rural. So we ended up in West Virginia and rural Maryland. And so not only was I a minority, but I was a minority in a place where there were no other minorities anywhere. Mm. And so that was the first one was I didn't look like anyone and their assumptions about me were so far fetched. I couldn't even, under they, they, they had never seen someone Brown who wasn't Latino. And so they didn't even have a sense of where to place me. So that was the first one. And then, you know, we were Muslim, we are Muslim. And so I think there was this sense very early on that there is me, and then there is what every person thinks I am, whether it's the gay thing, the Muslim thing, the immigrant thing, whatever it is. There's a, there's a difference. There's a vast gap between who I know I am and what every single person's perceptions of me are, which is fueled by the news or, or terrorism or something. And so that, the origin story is a complete lack of belonging. And I will tell you only once in my life, I was in Morocco and some, a guy I was working with, a local producer, said, you know, there's this gay coffee house. Why don't you come? And I was like, I can't believe that there's a gay coffee house in a Muslim nation. And we went. And I was in a room of brown, Muslim, professional, gay men. And I thought, this is the first time in my life I am the majority. Ever. And it was that one instance of my life. Um, and so, who is the other? What do they think of me? What is the difference between us and them? How does that wall between us and them change as news happens and culture happens? And that has been the story of my life. And so developing a patience to say, or choice, developing, coming at the choice to say, I can either be angry or I can try and navigate this gap and try and stitch up what you think I am to what I am. 
And, and what's so incredibly inspiring about that, and what a great example, is you could have chosen to be angry. You could have chosen to stay bitter and hide, and you chose the courageous route to reach out. Um, I know one of the pain, most painful stories of your life, I want to I ask you to tell about, was 9-11 mm -hmm. and your experience of donating blood. Talk about that. So I lived downtown on 9-11. I watched the towers fall from the roof of my building. Um, I remember the ash and the smoke and the smell, the smell, God, that smell. And so some friends of mine and I uh, didn't know what to do. And my dad's a doctor. So I thought, okay, if there are injuries, we should, we should go stand in line and donate blood. We have no idea what the injuries will be. We have no idea people are crushed, but we have no idea. So on my block was St. Vincent's Hospital on 7th Avenue and 13th Street. And so we went and stood in line. And there was a bunch of other people there too, because again, it's, you're talking about September 12th in the morning. We have no idea what's going on. And I'm actually under lockdown in downtown Manhattan. I have to show ID to get in and out of my home. Um, and I could see it. And again, it comes from being in my skin for so long, I could see the line shifting. And I remember thinking to myself, this is might be in your head. And then I could tell it was shifting. And someone came very close to my face and said, we should fucking kill your family. And another person, not close to them, not connected said, yeah. And I could feel the line turn and my friends were standing with me and had never seen such blatant hate in daylight in downtown Manhattan half a block from my apartment. And so they rushed me out of there. And for about a week, at least a week, maybe two, my friends would take turns walking me, picking me up at home, walking me to the office. Um, I was asked to leave cabs. I was asked to leave my, my bar, Johnny's, uh, which was on Greenwich Avenue, dive bar. Um, the bartender came over to me and said, there, there are people uncomfortable. I hate, and he knew me. He's like, I hate to do this. And I'm like, I get it. I get it. Um, and that was an instance to me of the enemy line shifting and they shift so often and I can feel them shifting um, because what people's perception of me changes based on the last bit of information they've read. And so I'm constantly watching those lines and that attitude shift and trying to adjust and gauge it productively if I can. Um, but it was incredibly hard. The other one that really sticks out to me in 1979 uh, I was in a Catholic school, 1978 or nine. I was in a Catholic school, total goody goody student, wanted to be milk monitor, was in the oversized fridge, freezer locker, loading up a tray of milks. And I think I was a fourth, first or second grader, and a fifth grader came in and shoved me in. I remember it. I remember the door closing. And, uh, and I remember thinking, I'm not even who you think I am. I'm not from Iran. I, I'm, I'm on another side of a border. I'm not even in the country you think I am. And, uh, and then it was, it was that and then coming home and knowing I was gay and being like, okay, I can't even be myself in front of my family. Um, it, it, was, it was always something. It was always, always something. And uh, by the way, my voice cracked. It's there. You know, it's there. Yeah. I, I, it's always there. And so when I actually let myself dip into it, it's, it shocks me by its emotional depth. The thing that I love so much about what you've done is that you truly embody the, the notion of lived experience. Mm -hmm. you, 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 you cannot talk about the theory of cohesion or collaboration or the theory of empathy or you know, having compassion for people who are different than you. You have to live the experience. Mm -hmm. So you've devoted your life now to actually creating experience to force it. Mm -hmm. right? you, you've now created this phenomenal sort of petri dish of differences called, uh, with your model called Epic. And in these four chair conversations where you put people of differences in each other's faces and you force them to live the experience of the other, mm -hmm. um, which I think should be required experiences for the world. So talk about the model, talk about what, what, what you're seeing in its lived experience for the people in the four chairs. It's interesting, just getting back to management, you know, what I do is I produce shows. And what's interesting about that is that each show is its own company. It's like, it's a startup, it comes together, you go through this intense period where you have to, production levels are high and stress levels are high, and then it sort of winds down. And each show is its own company. And I've always been a showrunner, I've always been the executive producer. And so even the management of people, thousands and thousands and thousands of people that I've managed since I've been executive producing since I was 29 years old, it's, it's amazing how our perspective of ourselves and others in the world is brought into our perspective of ourselves and others in work that it's either the rift between the males and the females, 
the black producers and the white producers, the young ones and the old ones. There's so many times that I see this otherness going on when we all are side by side in the trenches. And it's amazing to me that as we're doing the same thing, our perception of who we are is entirely different. Mm -hmm. um, and so for, four chairs to me came from this concept. And I remember saying to Glenn, I think you could change the face. You could, you could, you could eliminate hate with just four chairs. Um, and the reason for it came from the problem is a conversation between two people has nowhere to go if it hits an impasse. Mm -hmm. There's no outside perspective. There's nowhere to go. So you add a third person. And by adding a third person, you're inherently saying the issue is not black and white. It's gray. With two people, it can be black and white. You add a third person, it's suddenly gray. So there's context. Then you add a fourth person whose job is just to listen and to moderate and to enforce the rules. And that is, to me, the secret of the model is that you have a dynamic that there is gray cannot be black and white because it's not two people there's gray and then you have someone actively forcing each other to shift chairs to see if you can see what it's like to think like that person i always tell people you know what you think you already know what you think the whole point of a conversation is to gauge and learn what someone else thinks that's not inside your head if you're not actively trying to shift chairs and sit in their chair and see the world from their perspective with their life experiences, you'll never understand the way they think. And you'll always be at an impasse. Um, the shifting chairs requires people to acknowledge that the way you see your, the world and everything from who you vote for president to the kind of house you buy, to whether you want to have a gun or not, to whether you believe in abortion or not, is entirely dependent on how you have lived the thousands and thousands and thousands of days of your life. Having an older sister can make someone highly sensitive to feminist issues as a male. Um, I was so happy when, my son, when I had a daughter first and then a son, because it's very hard for a man to objectify women if he's had an older sister. It's very hard. You can't just look at women as an object if you have an older sister. Those life experiences, who were your siblings? Were you the oldest? Were you the youngest? Did your parents struggle? Were you in a rural area? Was there always violence nearby? Was there always financial struggle? Was, did mom and dad fight? Did mom get advantages in life that, that others didn't? All of that, when you talk about it, is a minute. But you live it minute to minute, hour to hour, day after day. It forms your view of the world. So until you acknowledge that those glasses, those goggles, that you are looking at the world is shaped by the life you've lived, and that is true of the person you're talking to, until you acknowledge that they have goggles on shaped by the way they live their life, you're not going to see things the way I see them. You have to try on the goggles. And the way you try on the goggles is by shifting chairs. And that is the way you understand what it is like to think like a different person. If I, if I lived the life of this guy, Mike Miller, who lives in Toledo, Ohio, I would vote for Trump too. Obviously, if I knew what he knew and I lived life the way he did, I would vote for Trump. I absolutely would. That allows me the peace to know that it's not good versus bad, us versus them, evil versus wrong. It's about perspective and how you've lived your life and what are the vital interests for you and your family and the people you love. Because I wanted to have children and get married as a gay man, that was a huge thing for me. That doesn't mean that someone in rural Alaska needs to have the same passion for gay marriage than I do. Obviously, it's more relevant to me. For them, they're worried about financially being able to make money so that their, their trailer sitting on its foundation that slipped off, they could possibly put it back on the foundation if they could just earn enough money, if they could just, you know. The, I remember a fisherman telling me he goes to the diner and drinks coffee all day because he has no money because his, shit, his entire fishing career is gone. Um, the shifting of chairs, the sitting in someone else's chair and looking at it from their perspective, looking at the world from this chair, this direction is what people need to do. I think our social media has trained us to cherry pick apart our, 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 the conversations, right? I want to pick my favorite part. I want to align with the good cops. I want to align with the, I hate when I hate cops. I want to align with the Black Lives Matter movement and I want to align with the, 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 the folks who are being discriminated against. Or I want to be anti-thug. Um, social media allows us to engage with the world and each other's with zero emotional vulnerability. Not only that, social media punishes emotional vulnerability. One troll comment, 
one, one snide remark will destroy the emotional vulnerability of a long exchange. One will come. And so not only do we have no emotional vulnerability, it actively punishes emotional vulnerability. And so we are literally learning how to be emotionally vulnerable, one human being to another again, because all of our methods of interaction have zero emotional vulnerability anymore. So we not, we're not comfortable engaging it. And so objectification and vilification are mm. so easy. They're, so easy. It's, it's instant. So, so when we don't shift chairs, when we don't do that, when we stay in our own world, why does that promote dishonesty and self-interest? Because it's not about the topic anymore. The, the thing that I find using Epic and Four Chairs is it, foc it, la it makes us focus on the topic rather than all of our reactions to it, all the information we have about it, all the data we have about it. It just makes us embrace the topic at hand. When we're not connecting with each other, when we're not have seams that are stitched, it's no longer about the topic. It's about our ego's protection Mm. of other people's perception of the topic. It, 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 ne it doesn't become about me being married to a man and having children. It has to do with me proving that you are wrong, that there is something wrong with you, that there are these labels I can use to diminish you. It has nothing to do with the actual wish, dream, or intention. Right. It has everything to do with the song and dance of protecting the ego. Um, there are times I'm engaging with people and I'm, I'm actively thinking, we're not even talking about the topic anymore. Like we, we left the topic ages ago. This is all about you and your dad and being wrong and not wanting to be embarrassed. Like this has nothing to do with the topic because we spend so much time. Trees communicate through their root system. And when we engage in four chairs, there are so many small nonverbal cues that we're giving each other to create trust, to create connection, to create humanity. All those nonverbal cues are reading and they're, they're deepening the connection. When we don't do that, and we're just exchanging information or texts or posts, there, there, is no, um, there, there is no depth to it. It's entirely about the ego um, and, not, and not the topic. Um, how we feel about our egos engaging the world, um, that relationship of us with our ego as we navigate the world is the difference between a happy life and an unhappy life. Yeah. Um, I think when people forget, when people don't choose to connect, they choose to protect, and then everything becomes about that protection. And it is, yeah, it, it, it's, it amazes me, yeah, it, it, we shift the priority from being about the topic that we hope to connect with, and it becomes about our ego and protecting our reputation. Riaz, I can't, thank you, thank you, thank you, as always, for your incredible rich wisdom and insight. And thank you for just being you and for all that you do in the world to make it better. Have you ever felt like your voice was muted by the biases or perceptions of others? In today's episode of Voices, Khalil Smith is with Janae Johnson, founder and CEO of CTM Unlimited. In their conversation, Janae shares rich insight and her experience and guidance on how you can mitigate the biases that impede speaking up, and when you need to, how to seek out support from those around you. Take a listen. Janae, thank you, thank you, thank you for this time together. I am super excited for folks to be able to listen into our conversation. We've already been talking before we started recording, and I'm uh, amped yeah. up for this conversation. Um, but first, maybe if you can just introduce yourself to folks that do not have the fortune of knowing you yet. Sure. Khalil, thank you so much for having me. My name is Janae Johnson. I am the founder and CEO of CTM Unlimited, where we rescue geniuses. That's how we approach our human capital consulting firm and the work that we do 
But specifically, we are DEI disruptors. We are focused on flipping the tables on traditional diversity and inclusion mm -hmm. and getting real results that are data driven um, and that are things that you can actually see that are tangible in the business and not just checking the box. So I am excited to be here and I am ready to jump into the conversation. I know you are. And with that introduction, I know everybody is glued. Um, so, you know, the conversation we're going to have is all around kind of voice and speaking up. And, uh, you know, as I've asked folks, I would just love for you to define, like, what does that mean for you, either personally or professionally or however you would want to answer it? What does voice or speaking up mean to you? Yeah, so the speaking up part is very interesting because I think a lot of times we're presented with opportunities to speak up. And if we are tuned in to look for them, they will present themselves more often than not. Mm. Um, because a lot of times we do have this, this sort of notion that if I just put my head in the sand, then the thing will go away, whatever that thing is around us. But if you make a conscious decision to say, I'm going to pay attention to the environments in which I work, I'm going to pay attention into the neighborhoods in which I live, mm. I'm going to pay attention to what's going on in my own home. So I think um, you know, we think of speaking up as being, I'm standing on a podium and I'm speaking in front of thousands, but it could easily be that I observe something happening that is out of alignment with my core values or what is right in terms of how people should be treated. And I make a point to use my voice to say something. Um, and that saying something could even be directly to that person just to check and see if they're okay, right? Mm -hmm. That's the first step in that intervention to say, okay, I saw something that seemed like it was out of order. Let me check on that one individual. Or let me send an email to my leadership asking a question because there's something that I've observed in our organization that seems out of alignment. So that is my first step to speaking up. Mm -hmm. I think what I really want people to get, Khalil, is that it doesn't have to be this big thing. Like you don't have to do a campaign to speak up. It can easily just be tapping someone on the shoulder. Um, but I also understand that that does take courage, even if it just is one conversation or one email. But I would always encourage people to find that point of courage. But more importantly, start paying attention to what's happening around you and you will see a plethora of opportunities to speak up. Like there's mm -hmm. never going to be a time, I think, where we won't have an opportunity to use our voice um, to advocate for someone else or yeah. to really make sure that the right thing happens. Yeah. And Janae, how do you find that courage? Because I think, you know, courage for me is absolutely the right word. I've spoken about it before very publicly yeah. that, you know, that imposter syndrome or am I the right person to raise this or how am I going to look if I do? And so I'm curious, is it easy for you and you just lean into it or is it a challenge for you and you overcome it? Like where, where do you come from? Yeah, so first of all, as, as a person recovering from imposter syndrome, and I, and I think I will always be in recovery, I've had to get really comfortable with imperfect action. Mm. Um, for me, that was the hard part because I felt like, well, if you're going to call me an expert, if you're going to say I'm the go-to, or if you're going to invite me to your show and interview me, then I have to know everything and it has to be perfect. Yeah. Um, and my response or the way that I intervene or the way that I speak up has to be very um, precise, right? Mm -hmm. And so I found that that was not serving me well because right. it arrested me. Like it mm -hmm. kept me from actually being in action. And so I had to first get comfortable with imperfect action. I think secondly for me, it's about asking myself the question, well, what happens if I don't speak up? So in our business, one of the things that we focus a lot on is this idea of intervention in the workplace. So when you see something happening that is a representation of bias or discrimination or harassment, um, why are people not intervening? Mm. So this whole idea around the bystander effect and that you know everyone kind of thinks that someone else is gonna say something. Right. So if I think that you're gonna say something and you think that I'm gonna say something, then no one says anything at all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's about breaking through that barrier to say everyone has a responsibility um, to not just to speak up, but also to intervene, right? Mm. And that you can't put it on the other person because they probably won't do it. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I think, I hope that answers the question, but I think for me, it's about, well, if I don't speak up, I can't assume that somebody else is going to, and yeah. then what happens? Yeah. And Janae, so you spend a lot of your time teaching this to other people, both individual yeah. contributors and leaders. And I'm curious, what do you teach to be able to kind of make people either more comfortable with it or, um, you know, leaning through that discomfort? And is, is it different based on the power dynamics? Like, do you teach different yeah. things to individual contributors than you do to mid-level managers than you do to like CEOs and boards? Yeah, absolutely. So 
One of the things that we really talk about is about considering the time and space. Mm. So sometimes people feel like if I see something and I don't immediately call it out, then it's a missed opportunity. And sometimes that is a case, but a lot of times, let's say for instance, if you are an individual contributor and you're sitting in a, a session with an executive leader and that executive leader says something that is um, that represents his own or her own bias, or is just offensive to another person, you may not be in a position to call that out and get the best result, yeah. right? Yep. But we, what we do teach is that, first of all, start with your direct supervisor, your line manager, and have that conversation to say, hey, I'm coming to you for support. And then, you know, we've had some people say, well, my line manager is not the person to go to because they don't get it, right? Mm -hmm. And so you have to find out how do you build coalition and sort of look at who is that person that you can say, hey, listen, I observe this. I really want to say something. And can you help me? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so, you know, I also encourage people, hey, if you don't have anyone, like if there's no one in your workplace or in your organization that you can go to with that, you may need to reevaluate where you work. Right. I'm not encouraging people to quit their jobs, but right. that is indicative of the culture if there's no one who will stand with you. Yeah. Um, and so I also encourage people because some people will need time to process, right? Yeah. And we need to give people who are those introverts who are very thoughtful, who need to kind of go off and say, okay, what did I just hear? Yeah. What did this person just say? What does that mean? Um, maybe even checking with the person that that comment was directed to to say, hey, I felt like that was out of line. What did you think? Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's just about finding different approaches, but it doesn't have to be this whole, I'm going to stand up and bang on the table mm. and stop the meeting. Like that's not the only way to speak up. And yep. the other ways are just as effective, arguably even more so depending on who it's directed to. Yeah. Now, Janae, do you find any significant difference between kind of the speaking up that sometimes we think about as it relates to diversity, equity, inclusion, and the mm -hmm. speaking up as it relates to new ideas in the business or, um, you know, innovation or creativity or any of those other things? Like, are there significant differences between that? Or in your opinion, is it the same muscle? You know, I, I think it's the same base muscle, but, or let's say the same muscle group, if we're going to get into <laughs> like the physiology of it, it's the same muscle group, but maybe the major minor muscles are a little bit different because um, one of the things around speaking up is that we all take a personal risk assessment when we do it, right? Mm -hmm. Subconsciously, we are thinking about, well, what happens if I say something? And I think that risk assessment looks differently when you're talking about speaking up around diversity, equity, inclusion mm. versus speaking up because there's a new idea in the room and we need to honor the new idea. Mm. Um, so I think for a lot of people, speaking up for a new idea feels safer. So the mm. risk assessment would be different, right? So still the same muscle because it still requires courage to do that, yep. but the risk is probably lower. Like if I advocate for a new idea versus I advocate for a person of color who's being overlooked in the organization, mm -hmm. that, that's, a, that's a different kind of, I don't know that I, I feel that I'll be retaliated against for advocating for a new idea versus mm. I may actually have that fear of retaliation if I'm advocating for a person of color. If that makes sense. It does. It does. Final question for you. It's the one that I throw everybody at the end. Okay. If you had your magic wand and you could just wave it and we did more of something or less of something in order to solve for some of these challenges we've been talking about or create a more um, uh, fluid environment for speaking up, like what, what, would, what would that thing be? What do you want to see more of going forward or less of? Yeah, I, I, I think the big thing is we put so much um, fear and an energy towards things that may never actually happen, right? <laughs> so <laughs> we think about what we're most afraid of because fear a lot of times is a source that stops you from, from people from speaking up. Yeah. And so what we're most afraid of is not necessarily going to happen. And, you know, studies have shown that our fears have a low percentage of actually materializing. Mm -hmm. But think about how many people are left behind because of someone else's fear. Mm -hmm. um, and also I would encourage people People, particularly who are working in corporate spaces, to not put so much stock in um, that organization as their source for everything. Because if I look at my job as this is my source for everything, and if I lose this job, or if I lose my standing in this job, then I will have nothing left. There's yeah. no, I have no identity. Maybe I'll never get another job. Maybe I'll be ostracized. 
then a lot of times that fear alone will stop you from speaking up because you feel like I have to hold on to this. So I would encourage people to look inside themselves and understand that there is a source that is bigger than that job. Mm -hmm. And I think also thinking about the advocacy for other people and how impactful that is and how a lot of times there is someone who maybe hasn't found their courage that is just waiting on you to find yours. Mic drop. All right, I will take it. Danae, thank you so much for the time. I know you are busy. I know you've got a lot going on and I appreciate you carving out some of that to spend it with me and with others. And I will talk to you very, very soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. (laughs) Bye. Reevaluate your echo chamber. Who do you spend regular time with at work or outside of work? Are there people with whom you are able to have a heated disagreement and then amicably go out for a beer or a coffee? Do people you lead regularly come to you with dissenting ideas or challenging your thinking? If you don't have people around you who comfortably and routinely offer differing views without fear of retribution, you're in trouble. It means there's critical information you aren't getting about decisions you're making or relationships you're in or priorities you're setting. Whether at work or on social media, Pay attention to how you participate, whose viewpoints you aren't seeing, and actively seek out contradicting information to broaden your worldview. Which information sources could you incorporate into your life that would bring disconfirming and alternative views for you to consider? What about doing that makes you anxious? Think about it. Till next time, keep leaning into your moments of truth so that you can be the example of what it means to be honest.